No, you could do it with, and what, uh, that would be maybe one step ahead. So what we mean by, the question was, um, would this work for substitution and deletion? So if, if the child has learned a few letters and you have, uh, let's just say this is cat, and um, this is I sound. So we're going to do a substitution. We'll say, Billy, you've got cat. We want kit. So Billy's going to go up here and find the I. He says, this is the I. I'm going to take the A away here. And now we have tick. So that's a little bit more advanced. But that, you would build towards that. And now we have, um, what do we say, tick or kit? kit. And then I'd say, uh, Billy, can you give me just it? And he would take the k away. So that would be a deletion. Okay, so we want to we want kids to manipulate, and this these kind of exercises actually should be done gr as group exercises as well as individual exercises. And where should these be done? Where in school? Kindergarten. kindergarten. Should be done right in kindergarten, early kindergarten actually. Okay, and we don't typically do that in a real systematic way, and that's where reading instruction starts right here. Um, Should you get the children used to a certain letter means a certain sound? Um, no, you, uh, a certain color to a certain sound. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the kid. The younger, the little guys probably want to keep the colors and sounds together. But as they get a little older, you can start to get them to mix it up a bit. Yes, otherwise you need 26 different magnets, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah, you do. Actually, you need more than that because you get to something like this, right? Yeah. This is a digraph. It's two consonants that come to me together to make one sound. It's different from a blend, whereas if you have a PR, per, I can, um, let me pick another one, uh, FL, as in flat, you can hear the F and you can hear the O, right? But here, S and H, you can't distinguish those two sounds. S and H. So they come together and they make one sound. So this would get its own color because yeah. it's a distinct sound. Okay, so I think altogether there are probably about 30 to 32 distinct sounds that we would want colors for. But you take them in real small p bits, right? You, you don't put all 32 colors out. That'd be just way overwhelming. So you keep it, keep it small. But that's, that's phonemic awareness, right? And the kids have to have that. And if kids, it's very interesting. At this school that I was at when I started my uh, career in reading, I was really highly, highly, highly trained um, in something called Orton-Gillingham, which is a, a really strong phonics approach. Great program. Um, and we had kids who were coming to school. They were all kids who had reading uh, struggles. And we'd have two kids who would be very similar in their profiles. They would have the same general IQ, um, same socioeconomic background, Parents valued literacy in the same way. They were read to when they were young. They had all these advantages in life. And we'd give the kids Orton Gillingham in a really intense way, one-on-one -on -one instruction for an hour a day. And we'd see kids' learning curves just go like this. And then we saw other kids' you know, learning curve like this. And you have to ask why was this huge gap between in progress and the kids. And that's when I got really interested in research and I went back to get my grad, to do grad work. And it turns out back in the mid 80s, we didn't know as much about phonemic awareness as we do now, but those kids were breaking down at 12, 13, 14 years old because they didn't have the base of phonemic awareness. So, you know, it, it, it seems silly, but we were going back with 14 year old kids and doing these exercises until they built up. And you, you explain why you're doing it with a kid. You don't, at that age, the why, becomes very important. So you know, you're telling them this is what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay, uh, I think we talked about that. Can I ask one more question about, that's awesome. Can you use that to teach orthographic processing, so like patterns of CDC word families, or would that be too confusing? Um, it's a good question. You've had, some, you've had a lot of reading background. Oh, well, I'm a mom. Oh, yeah. well, you've done some research then. Um, so the question was orthographic patterns. Ortho orthography is the spelling system of a language. So um, could you use colors 
to re represent cl open and closed syllables and things like that, silent E syllables. I wouldn't. I think that's just, um, unless it gets so strong visually um, and, and very weak with the language side of things, I think it might be too complicated. Um, so how do you teach phonemic awareness? Well, you, rhyming games, you, you play with language, uh, like I explained before, and use color blocks to represent sound. The other thing that we do, um, which is very interesting, and it, it, it's around more around kids' spelling errors, uh, but when they're making spelling errors, 98% of all spelling errors are not random errors. They're coming from uh, uh, what we would term a phonological reason, and... A lot of that is the way the mouth is shaped and what's happening in co-articulation of letters. And let me give you an example. Um, this, now, now we're talking about phonology and uh, phonics, okay? Combination platter here. Okay, this child, this is a spelling word a child made that I was working with, and it is not, he's not trying to spell grip. What do you think he's trying to, it's a very good spelling error. Right. No. Now, let me give you a hint here. Most errors that kids make are not visual errors. When kids struggle to read or spell, um, it's generally not a visual problem. So this, you're saying grape or gripe, because of the way it looks. Okay, what's, what's this letter? G. How, how do you make the G, not the sound of G, but the J. Okay, that's G, J. So this kid was using G as in J. Drip, that's exactly what it is. That's very good, I don't, not too many people get that. Because, this D in drip, does it, does it sound like D? What does it sound like? Ch. Because what's happening is this R, the mouth in anticipation of this R, which is made like this, R. So in anticipation of this sound, this D is rounding off to become J. See, it's because it's pronounced, the mouth is trying to be ultra, efficient and it's starting the pronunciation of the R in this sound so it becomes drip so it's a great error but if you don't know where the error is coming from we call it an error of co-articulation these are co-articulated if you don't know that as a teacher you can't correct it so how do you how would you teach that if you know every single time that DR comes together, that phenomenon happens. The D becomes J. So how do you teach that to a child? I would do two things. I would take a mirror and I'd put it, I, first of all, I'd, have him, I'd show him myself and then I'd get a mirror and I'd put it in front of the child and say, pronounce drip, what's happening with your mouth? And they can actually see and feel the changes in the mouth, and why they made the spelling error that they did, okay? And then I would get a bunch of DR words, drop, drip, drink, you know, on and on, and ask the child to pronounce it. And every single time, the pronunciation is going to be exactly the same, so they can see that it's not a random thing, but it's... Would you have fingers spell it? Um, yeah, we do a lot of finger spelling here, but I don't know that it's going to help with a sound issue there. Because you're really not saying, when you finger spell, you isolate the sounds in the word, right? So cat is k, a, t. But with drip, you never get the d, r, i. It's always going to be j. So the confusion is still going to be there. Okay. Get, I'm getting way off topic. Okay, so phonics is simply the symbol sound structure of our language. So every letter, every visual abstraction, which is a letter, grapheme we call it, has a corresponding sound. Can I, before you get off on the phonics, I just have a question about the phonemic awareness. Um, just because you're saying that that's uh, so common, it, breaking down at that you know, early yeah. stage if you have an older child. 
and um, when the other kids at age appropriate were doing the rhyming games and the, you know all those things and you couldn't get that at all but then sort of has it but doesn't have it down pat so you kind of gloss over it how important is it to go back and have that really solid it's pretty important as opposed to just saying ah it's kind of good enough because everybody's way ahead no it's pretty important what I would do if you suspect that a child's way behind or behind it all with any of these strands is to have an assessment. There are some good assessments that we can do and just see how objective